So the last time we were in here, we left on talking about the structure of the organization of the JW Faith. And uh, I think we brought up elders, and that sort of gave us a list of a whole whole lot of other different governing sects and some kind of structure to this whole thing. And I think uh, the question was, who are the elders in the Jehovah's Witness faith? They are the ones that oversee each congregation in each town. So they are basically the ones in charge of each kingdom hall for every town. And how far out does that stretch? Worldwide. Do they have it set to regions and states and all that? Uh, it's pretty much, if the town is big enough to support a kingdom hall, there will be one. <clears throat> if the surrounding towns are smaller, it will pull the surrounding towns in. That way there's roughly, I think, 90 to 123 ish people in a kingdom hall but that could have changed since you know when i was one i think they do their best to pull the towns around them without going past that number and then if it gets big enough then they open another one in the town that doesn't have one in a weekend so they bus people in no it's just that is where you're located now it's going to be the closest one to where you're living. So each kingdom hall has its own set of elders? Yes. Do they have anyone that governs over them? There's a pres presiding overseer, and he does... I'm not sure how much area that one does, but he comes in from the governing body, body from New York, and he... He oversees the area. So they basically pay for this guy to come in, and <clears throat> everyone acts like he's Jesus. They completely change. They get extra dressed up just because he's coming. And he's just another guy. I don't know why people act different. You see people going out in field service that never go out in field service just because he's there. And he's going to conduct the group. And But he gets all of his funding from the Watchtower organization out of New York. That's the person they decided to send to make sure everybody and all the elders are acting appropriately. He talks to them. He has a meeting with them and says, what, what is your kingdom hall facing right now for tribulation? So then the elders then open up to him and tell them this person's struggling with this, this person's struggling with that. They, that's who they go to for their help. Even though You'll never know that the elders in the Kingdom Hall are talking to to another person. Which then reports back to the governing body, and that's in New York. So there's a headquarters in New York? Yes. You're hard-pressed to get in there unless you show up with a tour bus and you're going on an actual tour there. Uh... They have all of your records. They have basically all of your money. Um, they own, I don't know the exact number, but they own roughly, I think, last time I checked, it was six to seven different properties in New York that are undisclosed. In the beginning, back in like the 50s or 60s, I think, they bought all these multi-million dollar mansions they were supposed to be, you know, safe places for when Armageddon comes. That's where everyone was going to go to, these houses. But those houses now still sit there with people living in them that other people pay for. The donations to the Kingdom Halls? Yeah. What do they claim the donations to Kingdom Halls fund? They say it funds them... In New York, the big watchtower facility, it, it funds the um, <clears throat> the huge meetings that they have. It funds all of the P 
paper, all of, you know, the, they show you the factory and all that kind of stuff. But they have also, you know, a barn. It's really luxurious there. There's like fountains and the, you walk in, the floor is made of marble. It's like, this is not necessary. But I, I, when I went there, I was just blown away. Is every Jehovah's Witness given an opportunity to visit? No. How does one get an opportunity to visit? They have regular tours, and you have to buy a ticket on the bus, and you end up on this bus. Who knows who you're sitting next to, and then you're stuck watching TV that they pick and choose for everybody on the bus, and it's just it's supposed to be something that brings you, you know, as a group closer together, but it's a really actually quite a long day. What is the significance of having the headquarters in New York? That's where it started. It was called the Watchtower. The, there's a building in New York called the Watchtower, and that's where I, I think, don't hold me this, I think that's where Charles J. Rutherford started everything. So he then had that building, I think, I could be wrong, this is all a lot of deep knowledge. Um, and then it just built and built and built and built. And then they bought other things, they bought land, and it's a good Google search. <laughs> so essentially it's... I don't want to say false information, so I just... I don't know exact numbers on what it is or who had the building first, but I do believe that that is where it all started. That's where the paper factory was, and it's just a building called the Watchtower, and it was built like a Watchtower. It was kind of a neat building, but it wasn't built for him or this organization. How does someone become an elder? Well, first you have to uh, be an auxiliary pioneer for, I think, roughly a year and a half. Uh, then you have to become a ministerial servant. After you become a ministerial servant that for long enough and they think that it's your time to move up, it's usually if an elder passes away or something like that, or if they just need another elder on board and and then they ask the ministerial servant to become an elder. It's almost like rank. It's it's kind of like that good standing thing. The higher you are up in ranks, the better standing you are. However, a female can be an auxiliary pioneer. After that, she can only be a ministerial servant's wife, an elder's wife. It stops there for them. So there's no motivation for the women to try harder? Well, the only motivation is, is that they're supposed to be submissive. So they think that they are also doing the right thing by being, okay. What? It just kind of takes away their voice. So only men are able to become elders? Correct. Do men fight over that position? Never. Never. They never fight over it. Um... I actually met a ministerial servant that they wanted to be an elder, and he actually declined. He declined wanting that position. They asked him to be an elder. He declined, and then all that information went out to everyone because, you know, everybody knows everything. And then he disappeared. He disappeared. He moved far. Uh, that's what I was told. He moved far, far away. I think there was a little bit more going on with his personal family in that kingdom hall. So that could have been the reason he left, but he did decline. I sort of liked him. I thought he was down to earth. And I that's why I still like him, because I thought he was a down to earth ministerial servant and he actually declined. <laughs> Is that taboo to decline? I think it's honest, but yeah, it's taboo. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh no, he doesn't actually believe what he's doing, but really he does believe what he's doing. He was an honest one. You think it's just not wanting that responsibility? I think once you become a ministerial servant, you learn the inner workings of the organization. And if you are not brainwashed, then you would walk away, and that is the only time I've ever seen 
someone walk away because usually getting that offer to you is some kind of famous thing. Oh, you're going to be an elder now. Everybody respects you and has to look up to you. And sometimes it's probably hard to be an elder because people tell you things and then you have to react a certain way that they want you to react, meaning the governing body. So I can understand why someone might not want to be an elder. I know I wouldn't want to be one. What do you know the responsibilities of an elder to be? It's basically making judicial decisions in that congregation or overseeing to make sure that everything works smooth. If you have a problem, you go talk to an elder, confide in an elder. That's, that's what they want you to do. They want you to confide in an elder. But elders are just people too. <laughs> you can be a good person or you can be a bad person and you confide in the wrong one and just like everybody else. Are you supposed to confide in an elder before you confide in your parents? That is completely up to you. If you are baptized, you may confide in an elder. Uh, if you don't tell your parents, then you also don't tell your parents. Then that elder decides whether or not if it's serious enough, because you're not 18, where the parents should know which that can act as sort of a double-edged sword. <laughs> which one would you go with? It depends on what I did. <laughs> I wouldn't have, I mean, every situation is different because every kid's relationship with their parent is different. Maybe they have a strong bond with them and they feel like they can confide in their parents. And I think that's the most healthiest thing. To confide in a stranger who you don't even know, know, and this person is supposed to be considered your elder and your brother, seems a bit unhealthy to me. I can understand that talking about certain things can be uncomfortable to talk to your parents about. So that's why I think maybe it could be set up a bit better. You have ideas to improve it? I tend to try to look on the bright side of things, so if they did improve it, I think that they should make it so that if it's an uncomfortable thing to talk to your parents about, you can actually talk to someone in your age bracket, but the whole religion <clears throat> not even religion, whatever you want to call it, is it's trained to make everybody kind of, no one likes a tattletale, but everyone's a tattletale, you know? So even if you did confide in your friend, the right thing to do, according to them, is to then tell your parents or tell an elder because they're sinning. So. When you ask me if I have a way of improving it, no, I don't, because there's no way that you can improve it because they already have those bases covered. <laughs> they, they got you on that one. <laughs> so who would you confide in first? Me personally? Yes. A friend, a parent, or an elder? I think... Well, I mean, it would always be my friends that were considered to be bad association or not in good standing. I'd always confide in them because I knew that they wouldn't say anything because it's called confiding in someone. <laughs> that's kind of what you are trying to do. Uh, that's me personally. I thought at first that um, confiding maybe in one of my relative's husbands was going to be a good idea because he was always funny and friendly with me. But it turns out everyone does the same thing and he, that person just went straight to the elders as well. So everything goes comes back to you if you confide in someone. What is the motivation to go to an elder 
on someone. It's to make sure that that person sinning realizes that they're sinning and it gets handled correctly because everyone should pay for their sins. What is and the te- you're just as bad as them. This is a teaching. You're not. Um, <laughs> you're just as bad as them if you don't tell the elders so that they can handle it how they see fit. Have you ever gone to the elders and someone else? I went to the elders on someone else once because I was pushed to go to the elders by the elder's daughter who I confided in. She didn't want to tell the elders what was going on or her dad because she knew that we confided in each other. And she pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and told me I need to talk to the elders about this. I need to talk to the elders about this. Because if I didn't talk to the elders about that, then it was on her. It was really, it was not even worth talking to the elders about it. Looking back, it was just some dramatic schoolyard junk. Did anyone get into further trouble? Uh, yeah. It ended up being me. Why did you get in trouble for going to the elders for someone? I got in trouble for going to the elders for someone because... Apparently, he was in better standing than me. And... We both got reproved. For what had happened, which was... Very... In, in my eyes, innocent. Um, and it's not even as bad as I don't think any of you were thinking. Crazy, like AOL, if anybody even knows what that is, an instant messaging conversation where he ended up thinking I was someone else and blurting out that he was into these things and it was like crazy things. Then I just had all that information. I was talking to the elder's daughter about it and she was like, you need to talk to the elders so that they know this about him. Because she didn't like this guy either, but it didn't matter. I went to the elders, and then because I wasn't even 18 yet, I ended up in a judicial meeting with them, and we all had to go down to the basement of the Kingdom Hall. My mom was there, and my dad was there, which made it even worse. So I then had to talk about it in front of my parents. So it's kind of not really worth it, I guess, unless you really need to talk to somebody about it. I say you should always talk to whichever of your parental units that you trust the most. That's who I would talk to. So you don't find any brotherhood in anyone in the faith? What what is a brother? No, I don't. Do you think the whole system breeds mistrust? It breeds a sense of you better not mess up because somebody's always watching. So you think that everyone is taught to be a tattletale or... They just want to know. They've built this... Society, which they call it the society, um, of people that don't realize what they're doing to other people because, once again, they think they're doing the right thing by telling other people's personal business to an elder. Like If I wanted an elder to know something like that, I would go to an elder. But you are taught the right thing to do is when you find something that is going against the rules of the organization, you should go and tell the elder immediately. You need to. That's the only thing that's going to make you safe in that situation is you need to tell. It's just they want to know everything. They want to know what you're doing all the time. They want to have their... They want everybody under their thumb. What is the justification for implementing that? I mean, if you're blindly leading 
what I think is a cult, wouldn't you want to make sure that everybody was under your thumb without them even realizing it? How does a Jehovah's Witness learn about the hierarchy of their faith? You slowly learn every book of the Bible, very slowly. And you go through and you read it, and then you talk about it, and they implement magazines that reference the scriptures that aren't the scriptures, it's their version of the Bible. They've changed it, there's no getting around that. They can change one little word, and it changes the entire meaning of a verse. So, that is how that works. When did you first know that there was authority in your church visits? A big waking up moment probably was when the presiding overseer was coming and I had to act different. You know, your shoes are polished. Your clothes are perfectly ironed that time. Everyone's, oh, oh the presiding overseer's coming. We gotta, I've never seen a kingdom hall more full of people. It's because nobody wants to look bad to the presiding overseer. You know, you're, rep you're representing this hall and you're all acting in a certain kind of way to make this guy think better about you. Who's that guy? Who is he? <laughs> Who is he? Nobody. I can't even remember his name. And he has this much control over people. How much time are you given before their visit? I think they let you know a month. If they randomly show up, that's never a good sign. That means there's something bad happening in that kingdom hall. So then, yeah, they randomly will show up. If there's a big issue going on, uh, you name it, they could randomly show up. And then you know because you didn't get warning that they're not here to judge you. They're judging whatever's going on that everyone else is talking about because you can find it in your brother. So it's not... A political visit, it's not for good faith. No. When they randomly show up? No. No, no, no. It's because they needed to call in... They needed to call in the executive arm. <laughs> they had to because they didn't know how to handle it. And that person has to make the decision how this weird situation is going to get handled. So a presiding overseer is requested... Yeah. By the elders. Like I said, yeah. They, you don't know if you, can find, if you can find an elder that they're actually bouncing that off of other people to protect themselves. And those are the ones up in New York. What sort of events would be of importance enough to call them in? I would say... Really, really bad things. <laughs> um, child molestation, something like that. Or there's a big issue going on with two families fighting and this person slept with that person and it's too intricate for a body of elders made of, I think, four to six to figure out on their own. And then if New York gets word of it and they're like, oh boy, and then it has to be that bad for them to fund someone to go stay in a hotel in that town who's the overseer to then make the final decision on how that is going to get handled. So we're talking probably anything involving law. If something's illegal, the presiding overseer is going to be involved, whether it be on the phone or if he just shows up. If he just shows up, it's not, not good. So they're called in to snuff things out, make things quiet? I wouldn't go that far. They're just in there to make sure things are being handled correctly. In the instance, if they just show up, they're making sure that they're protecting the organization by law correctly to protect themselves. Who sends in the presiding overseer? 
I think it's up to whoever the presiding overseer answers to, which is the governing body. Who's the governing body? They say the governing body exists of, and I'm going to say the wrong number right now, it's roughly, I think it's six to eight people. Uh, they run the Watchtower and Tract organization. You can Google it. That might be the wrong number now. That's what I think it was when I was one. But the that is the governing body. And you can't go to New York and ask and go up to the Watchtower place, whatever you want to call it, and say, I would like to talk to one of the members of the governing body. They will turn you down. They will not answer the door. They will turn the sprinklers on you. You can't. Because if you go there and you say, I want my records, I want to talk to someone from the governing body, they won't talk to you. So for me to say that there's six to eight people is kind of stupid because I know it takes more than six to eight people to run that building. It's so big, there's no way. So while those guys are probably listening to Yacht Radio, you know, nothing against Yacht Radio, I think it's great. Um, <laughs> I, I'm too educated thankfully to know that it takes more than six people to run that entire area so there's more people involved than they put out so there is a ceiling to how far you can rise in the ranks uh with jehovah's witness faith i believe the highest is 144,000. if you're one of the chosen one ones you get to go to heaven and work with god there, there's only 144,000 of those, though. And it might be some people with a special last name. No shade. So you think that the only ones who can be of the chosen 144 are people who kind of already decided that for themselves? I can't answer that. because people are not perfect. They like to say it's a perfect organization being ruled by imperfect people. So if people are known to make up lies, don't you think a lot of people would lie and say they are part of the 144,000 and they should eat the bread of the Christ or drink the wine, which is the blood, at the Passover just so they had a better ranking? In reality, <laughs> that I guess that is as high as you can go into the Watchtower and Track Society. Is maybe be part of the governing body, but why would you even? I I, always, I think back to that ministerial servant that was like, I don't want that job. I want to be an elder. And you think he was afraid of what would happen if he did? I think he knew the truth about the truth. <laughs> Honestly. What do you think that is? He knew all of the inner workings. He knew that there was a lot of not great things going on in the organization in of itself. In of what he was dealing with with his own family because I'm not, I won't get into it right now because I don't, I liked that person. Um, yeah, I think he just had enough of it and he saw how it all worked. I didn't understand at the time why he didn't want to be one, but then, then I realized. You think he chose family over power? I think he chose life. <laughs> I think he was like, I only got one life to live here. I'm not doing this. What? He, he disappeared. So how else do you get rid of someone that decided to walk away and be an apostate in their eyes? How else? You tell other people that they moved really far away. He probably got excommunicated. <laughs> 